Yeah. Uh-huh. 
minutes break. Stretching. In theory you can, but it takes uh, a lot of work. So that's why we got that camera that way. Sound and everything's in there. But yeah, in theory you can just match it up together. But you have to play with it, obviously. You have to match the sound. Yeah. yeah. Just testing to see whether it picks up the sound. Brahma God Sahampati, Lord of the world, with arms joined in reverence, requested a favor. Beings are here with but little dust in their eyes. Pray, teach the Dhamma out of compassion. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Asama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato asama sambuddhasa Namo atasa bhagavato Arahato asama sambuddhasa Buddhang dhammang sanghang namasami So today is the first day we experimenting with the live streaming, videoing there was a request from different people just to uh, um, video record our talks on Saturday. And uh, so we're just experimenting with the, uh, the new camera, so of course the, you are wondering. And um, today, that's something to bring up was um, to um, reflect on. Sometimes people think, um, paradox of the monastic life. We talk a lot about uh, letting go, finding freedom, and, uh, and yet uh, the forest tradition, certainly the Thai forest tradition, 
It's very regimented. You have to wake up at a certain time every day. You have to uh, sit in the same place every day. You, have to sit, you get to sit where you want to sit. To eat certain kind of food people offer you. You can't have any money. You have all these gazillion precepts, that, the rules that you have to keep. You have to eat in a certain way. And you're probably thinking, I come to be free, not to be burdened with these silly rules. And we do get people hearing a lot, it's like, oh, you guys are just attached to the rules. You're just control freaks. And uh, so, yeah, there's a certain amount of uh, uh, control. And I think the paradox is that unless we have a, uh, a control environment, it's hard to see um, our attachment. It's hard to see the defilements of the mind that comes up. As most of you know, live in the world. You get to do what you want to do. And you don't see where our preferences are. We might have an idea that we have to uh, work on certain areas. We might have an idea that oh, I have issues with anger. I have issues with uh, securities or anxieties. But unless you live in an environment where only a few things are moving, then you see more clearly the different issues that comes up in the mind, the liking and disliking. And we narrow down the possible variations of the, the schedule. It's through that that we see our emotional state, the likes and disliking that rises the moods of inspiration and annoyance and depression or irritation that arises in the mind. It's uh, a good simile. It's like uh, you look into a, uh, what is it called, uh, like a, a ping pong machine. It's bouncing around a lot. It's hard to see. But you just have one ball bouncing and slowly. Then you get to see clearly what the, you know, where it's going, what it's hitting. And you see that more clearly. So that's the reason, I think, for the, uh, the, skip, the structured environment. That's the reason, uh, um, I think, uh, Ajahn Chah, the different meditation master, set it up every day. You know, there's chanting at 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock. There's an arms round that takes place pretty much dawn. And after that, there's a bit of sweeping here. You know, there's a bit of chores you do. And then the meal's at 10 o'clock or 10-ish. And then eat, sit the same, you know, sit at the same places mostly, for monks anyway. You wear the same clothes. Keeps it simple to see the, the, the changes in the mind. You wear the same clothes, you have to think about what you're going to wear, you have a few possessions, a few duties that we do. But the day is generally not much happens. And so we think. So then we can see more clearly the mind. And sometimes people get the idea that it must be so boring in the monastery life. You don't get to watch TV, you don't get to go anywhere, you don't get access to the internet much. You get to see the same boring faces over and over again. Don't you get really bored, Ajahn? No, as most of you know, when you go to a monastery, no, it's far from that, actually. Because what interactions we have yeah, starts to make more of an impression that we get to see more clearly, and we also see more clearly our reactions to them that allow us to start working on it. See the silly mind of ours with all its variations of preferences and likes and dislikes and expectations, how we view the world, the judgment we make about others and ourselves. And we ultimately see how silly it all is. But it starts with a firm structure. So that's the reason for, you know, the precept, the eight precept. That's the reason for eating a certain time, in a certain way. Because we love to do what we want to do. But yeah, I mean, the mosquito bites you and you slap it. You have to see the reaction that, yeah, you know, the noise comes up and the refrain. So the path control what most people think. It's not completely letting go. It's a path that's about control. 
which is, I uh, gave this same talk in Bodhinyana and they, half the people want to leave. It's all about control, actually. <laughs> control in the good way. And as the simile I give, it's like, you want to grow a garden. You just throw the seed out there, you know, go back, have a cup of tea, and come back in three months' time. What do you think is going to happen? You're going to have a beautiful garden? You might. But the chances are that you might have a beautiful garden. It's very low. So you want to have a beautiful garden, you have to manage it. You have to dig up the soil. You want to prepare the soil. Loosen it. Put fertilizer on it. You have to prepare the ground, get rid of the weed. Then you want to plant your seedling. Make sure they're strong. And get water every day. And keep the weed away. Keep the insects away. And put fertilizer if it needs to. So it's a constant watching. Constant controlling the environment. It's the same with the practice, same with the mind. But it's, uh, that's why I said, sometimes it's the practice, you get a feel for it. Because you sit about controlling, and you start controlling your mind, and of course you will get stressed up and uh, uh, have more, be a little bit funny, go a bit crazy. So it's not complete control, but it's not always complete letting go. As I always kind of uh, uh, encourage people, is that if you want a beautiful mind, you've got to work for it. It doesn't come naturally. What comes naturally, what comes free of charge, is greed, hatred, delusion, irritation, is um, jealousy, worries, and anxieties. That's the condition of an unenlightened mind. So you have these unwholesome you know, things in the mind. If you want to purify the mind, then you have to exercise some control. And that's where the practice, that's where the training comes in. That's why it's called the training. Training is something that you do constantly, something that you persevere with, something that happens like on a regular basis, on a daily basis, moment by moment. You let go of the training controlling parts and unwholesome states can come in. So as practitioner, you're hopefully trying to be aware. That's what the control is. It's putting your awareness on what's happening in the present moment. Instead of getting lost. But also, with the structure of the day, in one sense it's controlling you guys. You gotta get up at a certain time, you gotta eat at a certain time do the chores together, but there's also a lot of letting go. So what are you letting go? Your own preferences. I don't want to eat at 10, I want to eat at 9 o'clock, I'm kind of hungry. Oh, I, or can I be closer to 12 o'clock? You know, the rule says you eat before 12, so can we eat at 11 o'clock or something? Can I just get my meal and eat it later? No. So the family is letting go of our own preferences, letting go of our individuality that we think, letting go of our individual needs and letting go into the situation. And the reason that we're asked and encouraged to do that is we see that actually the more we learn to let go of the self, of the preferences, likes and dislikes, the less suffering there is. The more we learn to how to let go into a situation with minimal views and opinions, minimal preferences, the less we suffer. The more there's a sense of self, the more the suffering comes. The more that we have to be right, the more the suffering comes, because obviously never believe we're going to be wrong. And the mind is going to suffer a lot over that. And we attach to being right all the time. So that's the reason for the structure in most monastery is that it is the encouraging, it's the encouragement to let go into the situation, letting go, and that's part of life. Life is we have to learn to let go into nature. The body is sick, 
be aware of that and to adapt, to change into the situation accordingly. So hence, the, the controlling it. And it's not, but there is also, obviously, as in the beginning part, certainly with the sila, with the restraint, exercise, control when you can. You're going to say speech, you're irritated, it's probably a good idea to exercise restraint instead of blurting out what's annoying you all the time. But sometimes practitioners do take it the, to the extreme. They don't say anything and they ball it up and they explode. So that's not always uh, so uh, useful as well. So that's what I mean. With, with these practices, with the kind of word, you have to find out for yourself what your the balance is. Uh, the, the situation is annoying you every day in. Somebody is annoying you day in, day out. Or you find an uncomfortable situation. Yeah, the practice is to let go, to make peace. But you find that's difficult and it's building up tension, irritation over many days, many weeks. And then it's not time to express it to. You find the person is the one, or just express it to another person to find out. And to, to practice with it instead of, you know, wait, allow it to be bottled up and exploding in, uh, in uh, 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 a bad situation. And with the practice, the day-to-day -day practice, it's always one is, you know, to keep it real, to be honest, to be present, to acknowledge even if we have unwholesome mind states, unless till we acknowledge it, we can't do anything about it. So then I'm peaceful, I'm peaceful, we have a guy who's really peaceful. Yeah, everybody wants to be peaceful, but we have to acknowledge that sometimes we aren't so peaceful, that there are things irritating us, there are things that we are not seeing clearly. And that's fine. But to be acknowledged that we have things to work on, then the mind won't be able to work on things that you think that everything is fine, that you're always peaceful, always clear, always the compassionate. Sure, those are good um, uh, aspirations, but we have to keep it real. I always just tell people, you know, keep your feet on the ground. You can reach for the stars, but keep your feet on the ground. You always try to apply the Dhamma in day-to-day -day life into your own experience. And the more we are aware that things are happening, but the more we kind of find skillful ways to rub away the ego, the more we, the less we'll find that we're, we're suffering, less that there's any issues, anxieties. And that's where, you know, trying to bring mindfulness into it. Obviously, throughout the day, we have likes and dislikes. And instead of, and you see that, you, with mindfulness, you see clearly that there's likes and dislikes arising. There's, oh, I like this. There's liking, disliking. But the problem is, we're not mindful. The I comes in, it becomes, I like this, I like this, I don't like this, I don't like this person, I don't like this person. And the more there's an I behind it, you'll find that the more there's suffering around it position, the more that you make it more firm, there's just thoughts and emotions, views and opinions that arise just throughout the day. And the more we can be aware of it, we just say, yeah, okay, yeah, this is what's happening, but that's not permanent, it's not you. And the more we just say, yeah, happiness is just that much, irritation is just that much, it comes and it goes. Feeling inspired, it's just that much. Feeling depressed, yeah, it's just that much. Feeling emotional, yeah. that's what it is. I always encourage people, always just go to the body. Always just feel the sadness in the body, feel the happiness in the body, whether it's in your chest, your stomach, your face, your shoulders, instead of going to the head of why how much you like this, how much you like that, and how much you want to keep it, or you want to look forward to more of these things, and less of the things that we don't like. What 
does anxiety ski is like in the body? What does worry feel like? What does sleepiness feel like? And then we can start to understand these things when they come up more. We're not wasting our mental energy thinking about the trigger. We're trying to understand more the just emotional tones of the experience. And the more that's the strange thing, the more aware we are, the more we can let go of those things when it comes. And it's about exercising control. But controlling happens if you're aware of what's happening. And like I said, it's about controlling of developing wholesome states and steering away from unwholesome states. For those things to happen, we have to be present. We have to understand, what is my emotional state? Is this wholesome or unwholesome? If it's unwholesome, then how do I steer it towards a wholesome? How do I learn to you know, let it go or work with it? And it's not always about you know, uh, trying to suppress it, put it away. So that's where the, 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 the paradox is. By just understanding, by being present of these wholesome, unwholesome states. By just being aware of the unwholesome state, the anxieties, by learning to understand them, they fade away on their own. Really. Anxieties don't come away or negative emotions do not come away because we suppress it try to with, uh, with samadhi. You can do that for a little bit. You can buddha your way to peace, practice anapanasati for a while, but it takes a lot of tension. So a lot of wisdom is required. Once understanding happens, when wisdom arises, and that's kind of the magic of the Dhamma, those things fade away on their own. It's not we or not banishing the negative states. The negative states, when you see clearly, those things fade away on their own. So it's a kind of organic, gradual path of increasing sense of happiness and well-being. The more clearly we see things, the less of a problem life becomes. That's why I encourage people, whatever it is we're going to experience, yeah, whatever the situation we find ourselves in, pleasant, unpleasant, terrible, don't make a problem out of it. We all have the wisdom, the intelligence, just to learn to make peace, to be the best. That's not saying that we all can get along all the time. Obviously, there are friction from time to time. There are differences. The views and opinions that crops up when we do things. When we, how to, you know, how to, uh, yeah, things that come up a lot. Yeah, how, how do we cope with this uh, COVID-19? We, you know. Keep everybody out all together, or we want to be more consistent with people we lounge in the kitchen. Some people say not to come and then they come. Other people we make quarantine and then other people just come every day. Or somebody comes once a week. Yeah. So it's always, you know, with the community there is always um, different ways of doing things. But we don't have to allow that. And there's always different opinions and there's always some tension because, you know, with 10 people in the room, we have, you know, at least, you know, nine different ways to, uh, to perceive the situation and learn to how to, uh, to, uh, to cope with the situation. But as practitioner, hopefully, we're learning not to make a problem, whatever it is. And learning to be present, to be aware of the different states that arises in our mind, to understand whether it's wholesome or not wholesome, and to always try to develop different wholesome states of the mind. It could be the five spiritual qualities, your faith, your energy, your mindfulness, and your wisdom faculty. Control your mind and belief. You want to be to let it go, to let everything go, let everything hang out. It's probably not the right place for you. I think it's a bit. If you 
That's a thousand kilometers north of us, but it's in Byron Bay somewhere. But it's also not a path of being, obviously, OCD or neurotic, controlling everything, you know, just could just the way. I find that, that within the structure, actually, there's a lot of um, happiness. There's a lot of joy in just the rhythm of the day, just keeping a clue to And you find out as you progress, or as you, you know, like, uh, live in, in, in a... Uh, a control environment. Um, just the little things bring a lot of happiness. And actually, I just saw that actually in the article. It says how to be happy. And one of the ways they said to be happy is to spend just a couple of minutes a day cleaning your room, they says. Just fold your socks, put things down. And they said, when you do small things like that, it brings a sense of accomplishment. Yeah, I can, you know, can't solve the world, can't clear up COVID-19 bring world peace, but you know what? I can fold my socks and put it in order. Keep my table clean, wipe my table, and put that in order a little bit. Yeah. And just they said, just do a minute or two of that. Just a little cleaning job brings a lot of happiness. And that's, uh, yeah, I always wonder. Sometimes, you know, you're walking down and you see a nice break path. Uh, that also brings, oh, sense of, yeah, maybe, or well, maybe I'm a control freak and I have to like things neat and clear. No, there's a balance. Obviously, in the monastery, because of the structured environment, we do get some people who err on the side of also being a bit of OCD that have to get everything precisely neat and clean, or otherwise they don't feel. Always, there was always a balance. And with anything, you know, be present, be aware, and use your common sense. Am I growing and being at ease in happiness? a sense of well-being, a sense of connection with myself and the people around me, or I am getting more anxious, irritated, as time goes on. Because, you know, the path of, of practice, the Buddha laid out, is not something that you have to wait till you die to find out. You know, it's beautiful in the beginning, beautiful in the middle, and beautiful in the end. So it's something we can always reflect. Am I growing in wholesome states of mind? Or is my unwholesome states of mind diminishing? Yeah. So that's a few reflections I'll offer you today regarding control. It's all about control, okay? Don't, don't, don't bind you what they say about letting go. You have to control first, and then you can let go a bit later. You have to get yourself in the cushion, the mat first. Get your bum on the mat, then you can let go. Otherwise, nothing happens. You let go, everything hang out. You won't, you're not in, you won't get yourself even to the monastery. You'll be at home somewhere, shopping mall. And it's all about keeping it real, okay? Keep your feet in the ground and use your common sense. So I'll put those for your reflection tonight. Um.